Well, I'm sure uh, a lot of good seats have been had by uh, some of you here, just uh, seats of privilege or seats of uh, sp spectating amazing events. Uh, I, I remember I took a, a group of high schoolers to Guatemala and we were uh, doing a mission trip in really the indigenous areas and so really roughing it. And, and I get on the plane to go home and a few of these high schoolers are sitting first class with big smiles on their faces just they don't know what they did, but they were allowed to sit there, and they already had their food in front of them, uh, but I'm sure for many of them, the best seat uh, that they've had, uh, getting first class when they didn't even pay for it uh, from Guatemala all the way back home. Uh, and, and today, we're, we're looking at uh, another conversation that Jesus has with the scribes, and uh, it, it's, he's addressing some of them who, who have the best seats in the house, spiritually speaking, religiously speaking, and, and Jesus is going to come, come against that kind of hard, uh, that the best seats aren't always really the best. Uh, so let's, uh, let's pray, and then we'll get into this text for today. Well, Father God, uh, we just thank you for the opportunity to open up your word and to do so freely and to discuss it. So we just pray that uh, the truth of your word is communicated clearly today. And uh, we invite you just to open up our hearts. And God, I just want to commit ahead of time to uh, just committing to, to applying whatever we hear in a way that's pleasing to you, Lord. So give us the boldness and the faith to do that well. Uh, we invite your spirit to speak and to do a work in our hearts that only you can do. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, so you remember here kind of setting the stage, we're journeying through the Gospel of Mark. Next week we'll jump into chapter 13, only three chapters left. Uh, but what we have here is really a, a series of conversations that have taken place just in a day's time. We've been in uh, these conversations for uh, at least uh, a month here, uh, week five this week. Uh, but really the, the past month of our, our sermons happened in real time just in a day, within a, a few hours. So you you could go back, uh, if you open up your Bibles to Mark uh, chapter 12, just before chapter 12, chapter 11, verse 27 to 33, we saw that some uh, of the scribes, the elders, uh, the chief priests, they went up to Jesus and they were challenging his authority and Jesus kind of silenced them. He gave them a question that they weren't willing to answer. Uh, he followed that up beginning chapter 12 with a parable that spoke against those religious leaders, suggesting the fact that they may actually be the ones who are going to uh, betray or kill the Son of God. Uh, and then we'll see here uh, verse 13 of chapter 12, we got on to the Pharisees and the Herodians came to Jesus, asked about paying taxes, and Jesus answered them in such a way that it left all the people marveling. They were just amazed at his wisdom and his response. The next step to challenge Jesus was the Sadducees. They thought they would give it a shot, uh, and they asked him about the resurrection and, and marriage after death and how that plays out. Again, Jesus doesn't back down. They don't, uh, they don't uh, allow the crowds to be divided, uh, but Jesus answers it extremely well and causes a, one of the scribes to then come forward. And he's thinking, man, this Jesus guy is answering these questions pretty well. Uh, let me ask him about the greatest commandment. And last week, Pastor Josh talked to you about uh, the great commandment. Uh, and again, Jesus answered extremely well. And if you read the end of that section, it says, and after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Finally, he's silenced them all. They've all taken their shot. They've all challenged him. They've all presented their problems, and Jesus has silenced them. But what we see today is Jesus isn't really quite done yet. It seems he's fielded all of these questions, so now he wants an opportunity to be the one to ask some questions to the crowd who's left, to the leaders who are left. Uh, and, and we're going to get into seeing just uh, what he's doing here is challenging these scribes with uh, their faith, the, these people who thought they were pleasing God. Um, he's going to challenge them. So let's read this text and then talk about how it applies to our lives. Verse 35, chapter 12, as Jesus taught in the temple, he said, how can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? 
the scribes were teaching that the Christ would be the son of David. Jesus was being recognized as the son of David. Jesus says, how can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David when David himself, empowered by the Holy Spirit, if you remember Psalm 110, says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. Did you see that? David himself calls him Lord. So how is he his son? And the great throng heard him gladly. And in his teaching, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes, and they like greetings in the marketplaces, and they have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts. They devour widows' houses, and for a pretense, they make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. So really, the... The biggest issue we have here is this question that Jesus asks that seems to be kind of difficult. How, how is the Christ going to be the son of David if he was also David's Lord? They don't seem to go together too well. Is Jesus here suggesting that the Christ is not the son of David? No, I don't think he's suggesting that at all. So what is Jesus trying to accomplish? What's he getting at in this text? I think Jesus is clearly trying to establish his identity. He wants people to know exactly who he is, who the Christ is. Because if you remember when he came into Jerusalem, people were already saying, Hosanna, the son of David, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So they're starting to see that maybe this Jesus guy is the son of David, but Jesus wants them to know he's much more than the son of David. He's also his Lord. You know, we saw really the entire purpose of this whole gospel is to identify who Jesus is. Throughout the gospel of Mark, we see this question surfacing, who is this man? You know, the turning point of the whole gospel is built around it. Mark chapter 8, verse 27, Jesus looks at Peter and he asks, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, well, you're the Christ. And from that point forward, we see uh, the gospel shifts and, and Jesus changes his ministry from healing and, and doing all these miraculous things to journeying towards Jerusalem. Mark 14, 61, they're going to ask Jesus straight to his face, are you the Christ? Are you the son of the blessed, the son of God? And Jesus says, I am, and I will be seated at the right hand of power. And the climax of the gospel, narratively at least, I believe is absolutely the moment when Jesus stretches out his arms and he claims that it is finished and his head falls and this Roman centurion, an enemy of the gospel, an enemy of Jesus Christ, he looks up at Jesus and he says, truly this man was the son of God. And really, the beginning of Mark's gospel, the reader knows exactly who Jesus is. Mark 1, verse 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The whole gospel is structured in a way to show the reader this man is more than just a man. He's more than just some great person. He is the living Son of God. And Jesus desperately wants these people to know, I'm more than the Son of David. I'm coming to do more than just set up some rule over Rome or over uh, to regroup Israel. I've, I've come to completely destroy sin. And we can see it throughout the gospel. It's not until the end that Jesus starts making some bold claims about who he is because he knows it's probably going to get him killed. And the, the one that I just mentioned, Mark 14 62, when Jesus says, I am the Christ, I am the Son of the Blessed One, what is the response? Well, the chief priest, he tears his robes and he says, you've all heard it, you've heard the blasphemy, let's kill him. And they say, yeah, crucify him, and he's killed. So he knows if he makes that claim blatantly and just explicitly states, I am the Son of God, that it's going to lead to his death. And at this point in his ministry, he's not ready to make that claim. So He's going to try and kind of usher them into this same truth by using God's Word. He's going to share God's Word with them. I mentioned how he was claimed to be the son of David as he entered Jerusalem. You remember back when he healed a man? They said, could this be the son of David? And they said, no. The Pharisees stepped up, the religious leaders. They said, he's not the son of David. He's not from the Lord. He's from Beelzebul. He's, he's a possessed by Satan himself. 
See, from the very beginning, Jesus was just a little too much for these religious leaders. He's kind of a a threat to their entire system, it seems. You know, things were going pretty smoothly for them as religious leaders. They got to kind of call the shots and determine how everybody lived. And if just a king was coming, they could continue to do that under his rule. But Jesus wants them to know that he's more than this king. So how does he, how is he going to get them to this point? What does he do? We see here he uses a, a structure that would have been called a Haggadah question. A Haggadah question was something that uh, would take one scripture from the Old Testament, it would set it in front of these religious leaders, in this case, Psalm 110, where it says, uh, David says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until your enemies are put under your feet. And then they would bring another scripture the reference that Jesus or the Christ would be the son of David. And they say, hey, look, we got two scriptures here from the Old Testament. One says he's the Lord of David. One says he's the son of David. They don't seem to go together. So the, the pursuit that they're set out on is how do we harmonize these scriptures? How do we bring them in to unity with one another? They're both true. They're both from God's word, but they seem to contradict one another. How can we make them uh, exist together? And when you figure that out, then you learn a truth that surfaces from it and your, in, your understanding of God increases. So that's what they're trying to do here. If they're both true... How can they be harmonized? Well, it seems that the only way the Christ could be the Lord of David during his life and also a man who is to come in the line of David, his son, is if this person, the Christ, existed before David and also after David. But if that's the case, then it almost sounds like the Christ that everybody's going to be anticipating is divine or he's eternal, that he's almost godlike. He's more than just a king. He's more than just a person. And that's exactly what Jesus is trying to get them to recognize. Yes, the son of David has come, but he's so much more than just a king for this world. He is eternal. He existed even before David. And again, it's mentioned throughout the gospel. It starts by telling us he's the son of God. Peter identified it. You are the Christ. Jesus claims it. Mark 14, I am the Christ. The Roman centurion at the end, he was the Son of God. And that's what Jesus has been setting out to communicate the whole way through. So why is it that these religious leaders hate Jesus? They've been anticipating the Messiah, the one who the Old Testament have spoke of, they've been anticipating him uh, their whole lives and they're excited to receive this person. But when he comes, they hate him. They want to kill him. Why can't they join the crowds and shout out, shout out Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes, comes in the name of the Lord. Why do they have to step back? Why do people today deny it? Why do people today deny someone who come, has come to bring peace who has come to bring comfort, who has come to destroy evil. Why would people reject that message? They believed the Old Testament, the scribes did. They wanted this king to come. They anticipated him greatly. But now that he's arrived, it seems it's a little too much. They don't like how he's fitting in. Today, we all know people who want peace We know people who want a joy in their life. We know people who want to know the deep purpose and meaning of their life. That's exactly why Jesus came. Why do they reject him? God didn't send his son just to stand by and watch tragedies, natural disasters, and all these things just destroy people emotionally. That's not why Jesus came. Jesus came to destroy the evil that's causing all of that. Jesus wants the scribes to know The son of David isn't coming just to rule over Rome. He's not coming just to be a political leader. He's coming to destroy the sin of the world. Why don't they like him? Why is it so hard for them to accept him? Shouldn't they be excited that someone has come who can heal the sick and cast out demons and quiet the storms? Sounds like a pretty good person. Well, Mark shows us here exactly why. By including Jesus' follow-up statement about the scribes. And I think 
It may be a reason why many people today reject Jesus as more than just a historical figure. So let's read it, starting verse 38. In his teaching, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes, and they like greetings in the marketplaces, and they have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. They like walking around in their long robes. They like those nice clothes that show that they're well off and that they should be respected. Their nice dress, it shows their status. They're not poor. They're not uneducated. They're the top side of society, and they like that spot. They like going to the marketplaces and getting all the greetings. They like it when people know who they are. Even people close to them, they feel a sense of pride because they know who these people are. And they get the best seats in the synagogues. They get the best seats at all the big feasts and the large receptions. They don't sit with the general public. They've got the best seats in the house, and they like the privileges that they have. They like leading people, not submitting to people. It says they devour the widow's homes. They take advantage of people who are in financial need for their own benefit. They make long prayers so that they can look religious and righteous. But really, we see that it's their heart's intent to only, their only uh, intent of their heart is to preserve their own social status. It's to come across looking like they're religious and looking like they're righteous so that people respect them, but really in their hearts, they just want to have the good life. They really like how life is going. It's pretty comfortable. They get a lot of say in how life is going to unfold and how the people underneath them will live. The problem is, Jesus steps onto the stage and He arrives. He sees these men sitting in their seats of privilege, their seats of authority, and He's essentially coming up to them and saying, I see you sitting there in your seat of privilege, all the authority that you have, but excuse me, could I have your seat, please? They don't like that. Jesus says, you want to please God? Then you give up everything and you follow after Him. Do you want salvation? Deny yourself and start living how I'm teaching you to live. What did Jesus tell the rich man? Go sell everything you have and then come follow me. If you're here today and Jesus is your Lord and Savior, then you know the friction that these men are experiencing. We can't be followers of Jesus Christ without feeling this friction in our own lives. All of you who are saved by Jesus' gift of grace, you know what it's like when Jesus steps into your life and He says, Hey, I know how you used to behave on the weekends, but it's not acceptable anymore if you're going to follow after me. And if He has a hold of our hearts, then we say, You're right, Lord. Thank you for pointing this out and help me to live in a way that's pleasing to you. If he doesn't have hold of our hearts, then we step back and we say, sorry, Lord, I'm going to continue to do what I'd like to do on the weekends. Jesus steps in. He says, hey, I've seen how you handled your money before following after me, but now that's not acceptable for followers of Jesus Christ. And if he has our hearts, we say, you're right, Lord. And we count it a privilege to be able to participate in the growing of His kingdom. If He doesn't quite have our hearts, then we look at God in the face and we say, I'm going to continue to make my own financial decisions. I'll handle my money the way that I know is best. And Jesus says, I see how you spend your free time and how you treat your coworkers and your family. It's not acceptable anymore. And if He's grabbed our hearts, then we say, you're right, Lord. Forgive me for it and help me to live in a way that honors and pleases you. If he doesn't have our hearts, then we say, you know, I'm going to continue to spend my free time how I'd like, and I'm going to continue to run my business the way that I know is best. And I have a right to speak to my children that way from time to time. You see this setting aside of our pride and living in humility, submitting to Jesus as Lord, is a constant battle 
And I think so long as we're in the battle, so long as we're daily surrendering these uh, struggles and difficulties over to Christ and inviting Him to transform us, then we're doing okay. But if we ever fall into a routine of living in a way that God's Word teaches is not pleasing to Him, and it doesn't even slow us down, it doesn't cause us any hardship in our hearts, then I think we're in dangerous territory. That's exactly where the scribes were, and that's what he's talking about. The supposed God-fearers, the ones who are going to church all the time and praying a lot, they're dressing fancy, but their hearts, it's all about their own comfort, their own success. They were regularly disobeying God, and it didn't even slow them down. About three months ago, I preached on Mark 9, 42 to 50. That's the, the text that talks about how people would be better off with a millstone hung around their necks and cast in to the sea than they would to be just living a life of sin. During that sermon, I made this statement. I said, conscious disobedience is the millstone around our necks. Conscious disobedience is the millstone around our necks, and the teachings of Jesus clearly haven't changed. Psalm 110 the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies, place your enemies under your feet. Jesus concludes this conversation, verse 40, they will receive the greater condemnation. See, Jesus is painting a picture here for us that suggests the scribes are in fact not godly and they're not pleasing God in any way, but they're actually headed towards condemnation. They're enemies of the Lord. They'll soon be under his feet. And I've hope, I hope and I've been praying that today we all remember the seriousness of the call to be a follower of Jesus Christ, a privilege, the greatest gift that a person can ever know. His love is truly better than life. He is the joy and strength of our life. And if we believe that to be true, then I trust that we are joyfully submitting to His teachings because we know that his teachings are what lead us to freedom and his, uh, the truth. And truth is what leads us to freedom. Jesus doesn't want part of our lives. Jesus wants every last bit of it. And that's what the scribes were not willing to hand over. That's why they weren't willing to see that Jesus was more than just the son of David or that he was a, a person possessed. Because he was requiring all of their life. I think you could illustrate it this way. Let's suppose some rich men come into the service, into church, and the, the offering plate is there, and they write out some big checks, and they put their big checks in, and right after them comes in a, an older woman. She's a widow, and she's poor. She doesn't have much to give. The only thing she has to give is what she earned the day before sitting along the streets, and today that's only two small coins, uh, about a penny. So she throws that in. Who's Jesus more pleased with? He's more pleased with the woman. It's not an illustration. It's historical. It actually happened. It's here in the Scripture, verse 43. Jesus observed that same thing. Some rich man came, and they put some money in the box, a whole lot of money, actually. But then a poor woman came, and she put in everything she had. And in verse 43, Jesus says this, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. It actually happened. She was willing to put in everything. And that is what Jesus requires. Everything. She understands what it takes to please God, and she's willing to offer it. The scribes, these well-off, well-to-do men, they devoured the homes of the widows from their seats of religious power and authority, but it was the widows who actually understood what it meant to completely surrender to God. And we're not talking about money. We're talking about confessing that Jesus is Lord, and He deserves, and He's worthy of all of us, our entire life, our whole heart bowing before Him. So we can call Him Son of David all we want, 
but we may continue to live as enemies of the cross until we recognize that the Son of David is also the Lord of David, that He is the Son of God. He's the Messiah. And the only right offering for us to make is to give Him everything we've got. The religious leaders, they weren't seeing Jesus for who He truly was because their lives were getting in the way. They weren't willing to change. Their old way of honoring God could not receive the new teachings that Jesus was bringing. We need to make sure that our lives are not robbing us from seeing Jesus for who He really is. If we can live in regular patterns of sin without any hesitation, I imagine we do not truly believe that Jesus is the Son of God who gave His life for the sins of the world. Or perhaps we just need to invite the Holy Spirit to fill us and to teach us to hunger and thirst for the righteousness of Christ. Maybe we've been trying to go it alone under our own strength, and we need to discover what it is to have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. And if that's a a foreign language to us of being led by the Spirit daily and, and just bathing ourselves in God's Word, then we need to find someone who can help educate us on what it means to live a Spirit-filled life. I want to close with this uh, interesting bit of information. If you have a a Bible, you can open it up to Hebrews 10. If you don't have a Bible, grab the the Bible out of the pew back. I'll use that one this morning. Hebrews 10. For in the Pew Bibles, page 1873, and we'll start at verse 11, Hebrews 10, 11. Look what this says. Keep in mind uh, Psalm 110. To be seated beside the Father. Verse 11, it says this. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties Again and again he offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when this high priest, he's talking about Jesus, when Jesus had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool, because by one sacrifice he has made perfect perfect forever those who are being made holy. Psalm 110 The Lord said to my Lord, be seated at my right hand. But historically, the priests, they stood because daily, day after day, they were having to make their offer uh, offer of sacrifice for the sins that had been committed, and they can never uh, offer a sacrifice that's good enough. So the next day, they get up and they continue to do their work. And it's amazing that Jesus, the high priest, is seated. It's like his work is done. And it is done. It's finished, as Jesus said, because Jesus offered his life on the cross and he said it is finished and he came and he paid the perfect price because he was the son of God. The only way it could have been the perfect price is because he's so much more than the son of David, but he is the son of God. So when he stretched out his arms on the cross, he crucified the sins of the entire world. Any sin you've ever committed, any sin you will commit has been crucified on the cross with Jesus, and only because He was the Son of God. If you know you're not living as Jesus is Lord, He's paid the price for every sin, every wrongdoing we've ever committed. One payment on the cross. It's finished. There's nothing we can do to please God. There's nothing these scribes could have done to please God. We'd have to stand daily and labor day after day, but we can't. We're not perfect. Jesus is the only way to pleasing God, by receiving Him. And for those of us who are already believers, hear this. Uh, Let's skip ahead to verse 19. Hebrews 10, 19. Therefore, brothers, church, therefore, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, His body, 
And since we have a great priest over the house of God, Jesus, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Don't give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Verse 26, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of truth, no sacrifice for sins is left but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses, they died without mercy on the testimony of just two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, and again, the Lord will judge his people. It's a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Remember those earlier days after you had received the light, when you stood your ground in a great contest in the face of suffering? Sometimes you were even publicly exposed to insult and persecution, and at other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You sympathized with those in prison and you joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves, you had a better and a lasting possession. So don't throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised for in just a very little while, he who is coming will come and he will not delay but my righteous one will live by faith, and if he shrinks back, it will not be, I will not be pleased with him. But church, we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed. We're of those who believe and are saved. Are we a sinful people? Yes. Will we always be a sinful people? Yes. But our desire and our heart is set on Christ. It's the heart of Paul when he says, that that I want to do, I, I don't do it. The things that I don't want to do, that's what I'm doing. But do you see, his desire is to do that which pleases God. That's the mark of the Holy Spirit living inside of us. God hates sinful living, and he doesn't tolerate it. So the question we have today as we leave, can Jesus have the seat of authority in your life? Can Jesus have the seat of authority in every area of your life? Will you receive him as Lord and not just a man who came to do good? And our, will our lives affirm what we say we believe? Would you pray with me? Well, Father God, uh, we hear the interaction that your son Jesus had many years ago with some people who were uh, prideful in their positions and Lord just confess and recognize the temptation of that in our lives, uh, that we think maybe we can please you just how we want to, or we can uh, please you by what we do. And Father God, we just recognize today that there's nothing we can do uh, to please you besides bowing our hearts before your son Jesus, because he's the Savior and Lord of the universe. And God, if he's really the Savior and the Lord of the universe, then we know that He's worthy of our hearts and He's worthy of every day we have been given the opportunity to live. So God, just help us uh, to leave this place submitted to You and, and to do it joyfully. God, it's uh, the joy of our hearts as we recognize that as we submit, we're led into freedom and it's the freedom that we desire. So God, just allow us to uh, leave this place and boldly proclaim who your son Jesus is, that he's Lord of our lives and that we love him and that we want other people to love him. And God, just send your spirit uh, to work in each of our hearts how you know is best and how we need it. In Jesus' name, amen.